Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, I'm going to get into the word of the Lord today. Would you guys like to get into the word with me? Praise God. You know, today you didn't come to hear from a man or a woman. You didn't come to hear from me. It's not about hearing from Pastor Dan, Pastor Jim, Pastor Luke, Pastor Deb. No, this is not about hearing from us or men, not what men think or what men say. But rather, this is about coming into church and hearing from God. So, come on. Would you honor the Lord and stand to your feet? And I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord in prayer today and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're just grateful, thankful, and shouting about your goodness already and what you've done in this place. Thank you for your presence, God. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the things that have taken place in the hearts and lives of individuals already in this church service, God. And Lord, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further with you. We want to go deeper in relationship and understanding, God, and our experience of life with you. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come now and be our teacher, be our guide, and direct our attention to the things that you would have us to see and speak words that weren't even spoken from this pulpit, but your spirit speaks them to our hearts. So we open up your word. We pray that you would open us up to receive, God. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. We pray that you give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. And may it bear, bear fruit in our lives, God. We give you the praise and the glory. And Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody, but as co-laborers, workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 3 once again. We read this verse last week, but we really didn't get into the fullness of what it was talking about. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 19. Let me set the stage for you to, just to remember where we're at. There's an example that's being brought out of Scripture about the children of Israel. And as they had come out of Egypt, now they're about ready to enter into the promised land. They get up to the border of the promised land, and there they send out some spies. Ten spies bring back an evil report. Two spies bring back a good report. The nation decides not to follow the good report, but they allow themselves to be turned away to the evil report. And because of their disobedience, they are now turned away from the promised land, and they're not able to enter in. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 19 comes along and says these words. It says, so we see. In other words, this is not just a history lesson. This is not just something that we look at and we gather information. No, the Holy Spirit shows us things and gives us a revelation about what it means to our life. So we see something. We understand something. We, we can take note of something. We see what? That they could not enter in, speaking of the promised land, because of unbelief. Now, it's important for us to know why they did not enter into the promised land. This one word called unbelief stopped them from walking in and obtaining the promise of God for their life. So what is unbelief? Well, literally in the Greek and in the English, it works the same way. When you look up the word, it's the same principle in Greek as it is in English. So since I don't speak Greek and most of you in this room don't, I'm going to talk about the English way of understanding, okay? That way we can all track together. But when you have a word called belief, right, what does believe mean? Well, believe means that you have faith. Believe means that you trust, Believe means that you have a conviction or a firm persuasion and you can't be taken off of it, right? That's what it means to believe something, where you invest yourself in it. So now you take this prefix called un and you put that in front of the word belief and now you have unbelief, okay? Now we know that when you have unbelief, that is, is now the opposite of believing. Or we could say it like this, that it means a lack of faith, a lack of trust, a lack of conviction or a lack of firm persuasion that you can be easily taken off of or talked out of those things that you had believed. And so we see the nation of Israel, they were not able to enter into the promised land. Why? Because of unbelief, because of lack of faith. They were not operating in faith. They weren't believing God. They were in unbelief. They had no faith. There was a lack of trust even though God had brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, now they lacked trust that God could take care of the giants in the land that were ahead of them. They had a lack of conviction, and they were not 
persuaded. In fact, their hearts were turned away. They were persuaded to go back to Egypt. And they just said, let's select ourselves a leader and go back into bondage. Wow. Very important for you and I to stay away from this thing called unbelief. Today, I want to talk to you about the trap of unbelief. That's the title of today's message is the trap of unbelief. You see, there's nothing that the devil would love more than to get Christians, people that are born again, believing Christians, to fall into this trap. Why? Because it could stop us from obtaining the promises of God for our life. You know, he may have lost the battle with your soul. He may have lost you to the side of God, but you know what? He wants to make your life miserable. And so he sets this trap called unbelief. And you and I have to be very careful walking this walk of faith, living this life with God, that we don't fall into that trap. And so we see that they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. Because they were trapped. Because they walked into the bait of what the enemy had set for them, and now, bang, it clamped shut on them, and they were unable to enter into the promised land. Very important for us to take note of this. So today, I want to bring out some things that we see in the Word about how to avoid the trap of unbelief. If we're going to live this life and we're going to obtain the promises of God, we have to know how to avoid this trap. How do we stay away from it? How do we stay out of it? How do we recognize it? How do we realize what's going on and live the victorious Christian life and obtain the promises that God has for each and every one of us? Are you listening today? A couple of things that we're going to learn today about avoiding the trap of unbelief. Number one is that we've got to learn the word of God. Plain and simple. If you're going to stay out of the trap of unbelief, you've got to learn the word of God. You've got to learn the truth. Why? Because the Bible says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Set you free. Set you free from what? From a trap. From a trap of unbelief. Because if you know the truth, hey, I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. I'm going to believe God. God said it. I believe it. That settles it in my life. And now you will no longer be trapped in unbelief. Now, think about this for a second. Banks don't teach people about counterfeit money when they bring on a teller, somebody's new, and they're going to be working with money, that sort of a thing. They, when they're training them, they don't teach them about the counterfeit. In other words, they don't teach them the lie. But rather, what do they do? They do the opposite. They teach them about the truth. They give them real money, and they say, we want you to feel it. We want you to touch it. We want you to kind of, you know, just feel how it feels in your hand, you know, when you're, when you're counting it out. We want you to feel how that feels on, on, on your fingers. We want you to smell it. We want you to take a look at it. We want you to study it. We want you to see what we do with the prints and, and, and the, all the intricacies of what's put onto that bill. And, and also, you can hold it up to the light, and as you hold it up to the light, you'll notice a watermark, and there's some things that you'll see. Maybe it's a president's face, or maybe it's a strip that goes through it that tells you what, uh, what number bill that is, whether it's a five or a 10 or a 20 or, or a 1 million. Hallelujah. Something like that, right? So they teach them the truth. So that when they're up there and somebody comes in, they say, I'd like to deposit this money into the bank, and they grab that money, and they start counting it out, and all of a sudden, whoa, 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 wait a second, what is this? This doesn't feel right. This doesn't look right. They hold it up to the light, and there's no watermark. There's no little strip in there telling them what bill it is, and all of a sudden, they realize this is not the real deal. This is a lie. This is a counterfeit. For you and I, if we're going to stay out of the trap of unbelief, see, the unbelief is a lie. The unbelief is that God is not able. The unbelief is that we're going to fall in the promised land, that we're going to fail, that we're going to be defeated before our enemies. The, the lie is that you can't do it, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, that, that, that you haven't been around long enough to do this. See, that's the lie. And if we know the truth, the Bible says the truth shall set us free. So that means that we have to study, we have to know the word of God so that when we're counting out our life and when we're looking over our life, all of a sudden, wait a second, wait a second, what is this? Well, that's a lie. You hold it up to the light of God's word and you say, no, that's not the real deal. I know the truth and I'm not going into that trap. Amen. Now, in the Gospels, there's a story of when Jesus went to his own country. He travels back to Nazareth. There he starts to teach in the synagogue, and the people hear him, and the people realize, wait, wait a second, wait a second, this is Jesus. Don't I know his mommy? I mean, his daddy made the table that's in my house. This is Jesus. I remember him as a little kid in the schoolyard playing with my children. Where did 
they get this stuff from? They hear his eloquent words. They hear his preaching. They're amazed. They've heard about the miracle signs and wonders that he's done. And they start to take offense at Jesus. Rather than welcoming him as the hometown hero, they say, wait a second. How are, how are you better than us? You know, we, we, we knew you when you were a little kid. You know, we, we, we knew you all along. We know your family. Your brothers and sisters are here with, with us. And they start to wonder where he got all this stuff and how he got to where he is now. And, and I want you to turn with me to the book of Mark. And as you turn with me to the book of Mark, I'm going to read a verse in Matthew. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Mark chapter 6. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 6, but I liked what it said in Matthew. And I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. It says, now he, speaking of Jesus, did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So we just read that the children of Israel could not enter into the promised land because of unbelief. Now here he is in his own country. Here he is in Nazareth, in Galilee. And he couldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Once again, the trap was set. They fell into the trap. They didn't believe, and they did not receive. That means that on the opposite end of that, if they would have had faith, if they would have believed in Jesus, then he could have done a lot of mighty works. Is that true? See, if they would have been offended at him and said, where did he get all this stuff? That means if they would have said, hey, this is Jesus. We heard he's done miracles. Oh, well, he can do it for us too. That means the people that came in there sick could have got healed. The people that, walked, that, that came in lame would have walked away healed and whole, right? People that came in demon-possessed would have went out of that place free, right? Jesus could have done many mighty works there, but they didn't believe him, and so they didn't receive anything. Now, I had you turn to the book of Mark, chapter 6, verse number 6. Let's read it together. Mark, chapter 6, verse number 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus looks at their unbelief, and he's amazed. And he, and he marvels and just kind of wonders at it, right? What's going on here? My goodness. Now, look at what he does in response. The very next sentence, it says, Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. What can we learn from what Jesus does. Well, that means if we're going to avoid the trap of unbelief, we must be taught. We've got to be taught the word of God. See, Jesus knew these people are in a trap. They don't believe a thing that I'm saying. Therefore, I'm going to go out and I'm going to teach them the word of God. And then they'll believe and then they will receive. Are you listening today? That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, if we're going to combat unbelief, then we've got to combat it with what? Faith, with the truth, with the real deal. You see, the promised land was there for the children of Israel. It was waiting for them, but they had to walk through the wilderness. And it was never God's intent for them to wander in the wilderness like we spoke about last week. But God had to take them through that wilderness time. Why? Because the wilderness time is a teaching time. Every time you see it in the Word, there were different people that went through wilderness times in their life. Jesus was led into the wilderness. Why? To be tempted by Satan. And the Bible says that he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Elijah was led into the wilderness, right? And he was fed by ravens. That was a supernatural impartation on God's behalf to Elijah there. Now, drinking from a little brook, that's not a big deal. Anybody could do that, but being fed by ravens, that's supernatural. After Jesus was tempted by Satan, what happens? The angels come and they minister to him. Supernatural impartation. How about this? The children of Israel in the wilderness are fed with manna and with quail. There's a supernatural impartation that's given there in the wilderness. See, the wilderness time is meant to be walked. God had to lead them into the wilderness to give them the law, to teach them about himself, to show them who he is, right, and to set up the sacrificial system and to teach them about what was going to happen when the Messiah came. So the wilderness time is meant to be a time of teaching, a time of impartation, and it's meant to be a time where we listen and where we learn the truth, and then that truth will set us free. Free from what? The trap of unbelief. Amen? Amen. All right, you guys are mighty quiet, but I, I believe that you're listening today. Avoiding the trap of unbelief, number one, is that we've got to learn the word of God. Second thing, we're going to avoid the trap of unbelief. Second thing for today is remove your foot from entering the trap. In other words, if you're walking along 
and you see the trap, don't step in it. Don't meddle with it. See, sometimes people are, are walking along and, and they'll realize it and recognize it and they say, ah, not a big deal. Bam, you're stuck. We see this in the word. There's a man that had a son who was demon possessed. You're there in Mark chapter six. Turn with me to Mark chapter number nine. A couple pages over to Mark chapter number nine. And in Mark chapter number nine, Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? He's having this this moment with God, and and he's got three of his disciples with him. And there he meets up with Moses and Elijah. He's changed, right, into his glorified body. And and, and this supernatural thing happens. The voice comes from heaven. This is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him, right? Jesus comes down from the mountain, and as he comes down, there's a bunch of people, and there's a big scuffle going on, right? there's, there's, There's... Jesus' disciples, and then there's these Sadducees, and they're fighting, and they're, they're having an argument. And Jesus comes in, and he says, what's going on? And they said, well, you know, uh, this man brought his son who's demon-possessed to us, and, and we tried to cast the devil out of him, but we couldn't do anything. He says, bring the boy to me. So as they bring the boy in front of Jesus, this demon throws him down on the ground. He starts writhing around, starts moving around, and starts foaming at the mouth, completely demonic. Jesus turns to the Father in Mark chapter 9, Verse number 21, so he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. But now the father, who's speaking with Jesus, answers the question, but then he goes a step further. Here he is, he's walking along, and there's a trap that was set, and Jesus asked him a question. He answers the question. He didn't have to say anything else. But now watch what happens. Verse 22, the father continues speaking, and often... He has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. So he starts to recount and remember what's been happening to this child all of his life. From childhood, this has been going on. There's been a demon. And this is a murderous, demonic spirit that is throwing this child into the fire to destroy him or into the water to drown him. Now look at the very next words that he says. He continues to talk and he says these words, but if you can do anything, Have compassion on us and help us. Isn't that the way sometimes we approach God? I mean, sometimes we say, God, I I know you can heal, but I don't know if you can heal me. If you can do something, God, go ahead. Oh, God, I, I, I know that there are people who are blessed, Lord, but maybe I just don't seem to be one of those people, God. If you could pour some blessing out on my life, God, I see there's people that have it together. Their relationships are strong and solid. And maybe I'm just messed up, God. And if you could do something, Lord, go ahead and do it in me. But sometimes we wonder, maybe God doesn't want to bless me. Maybe God doesn't want to heal me. Maybe God doesn't want me to have a good life. Maybe this is the will of God for my life. And we say, God, if it be your will, do something if you can, but maybe you can't. Lord, maybe it's your will. Maybe it's not. But take a look at what Jesus does. Jesus sees the man. Jesus sees where he's going. Jesus sees the trap. And look how Jesus responds in verse number 23. Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. In other words, watch out. Your foot is about to fall into a trap. And the way to get out of that trap is not to operate in unbelief, but to believe, to walk in faith. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. The word of the Lord for you today is, if you can believe, then all things are possible to you who believe. Your healing is possible. Your prosperity is possible. Your goodness is possible. Your blessing is possible. Your relationships restored is possible. Your family being strong and healthy and serving the Lord is possible if you can believe. Now look at what the man does. This should be our response when we realize our foot's about to go into the trap. Look at verse 24. What is that first word in verse 24? Okay, there's about five of you that are reading your Bible right now. What is that first word in verse number 24? Oh, come on, I need everybody to say it together today. I need you to understand this because I'm not going to be there preaching this word to you when you've got a struggle, when there's a trap that your foot's about to be set in. You've got to recognize and realize the trap, and you've got to understand this. So everybody together, tell me, what is that first word in verse number 24? Immediately. 
immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. In other words, okay, Jesus, I see the trap. No, no, I'm not going there, but I believe. Help me in my unbelief. What did he do? He removed his foot from the trap. Now, the, the story goes on that a crowd starts to form and Jesus rebukes the spirit. It comes out of the boy after writhing him and, and, and rolling him around a little bit more. It comes out of him with a shriek and a cry. The, the father receives the son back and Jesus goes on his way and gets out of there. And the disciples that were down there trying to cast this demon out that couldn't, they got a bone to pick with Jesus. And they pull him aside privately and say, Jesus, now hold on a second. Used to be when you sent us out two by two, we would command the demons to come out. They come out. What happened? How come you could cast them out, but we couldn't cast them out? You gave us authority to do this. What happened? Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. I'll put it up on the overhead. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. See, sometimes we, 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 we're walking this walk of faith and we come up to our promised land and we see the promise of God for our life and, and, and we see it as an impossibility. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't know how it's going to work. We try and calculate it out. We say, well, well wait, wait a second. I don't got enough strength. I don't have enough ability. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough knowledge or smarts. I can't do it, God. And we start to put our foot in the trap. And Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. If all you got is just a little bit of faith, little teeny tiny seed faith, that little seed faith will go into the hard stony ground and it will sprout up, rise up, and become a tree that the birds of the air can camp in. And nothing will be impossible for you. Now the promised land, oftentimes in the Bible, I've, I've heard this taught, and I've seen people teach it this way, that, you know, Exodus, right, the Exodus and all that kind of stuff, that, that, that the, the land of Egypt is sin and death and all that kind of stuff, and we were delivered from sin and death, and then there's the wilderness time, and that's our life here on the earth, and then eventually we get to go to heaven, and that's the promised land. Now, let me tell you something. That is false teaching. That is not right according to the Word of God. Let me prove that to you, okay? Because, yes, Egypt does represent sin, we were delivered from the bondage of sin. The wilderness time is a teaching time. God is teaching us and preparing us for life. And then there is a promise, a personal promised land that we are to enter into here and now. Now, the children of Israel got to the border of the promised land, and they looked up and they saw what? Giants. They saw opposition, and they saw a war ahead of them. Let me ask you a question. In heaven, will there be giants? No, there will not be giants in heaven, okay? Will there be opposition in heaven? No, there will not. Is there a war in heaven awaiting us? No, the battle's been won. Jesus won the war. The war is over. He kicked the devil out. War broke out in heaven, but now Jesus has won the war by the purchase of his blood on the cross. He defeated the devil. He stripped him of his power, and now he's reigning on high in heaven, and you and I, when we go to heaven, there's no more war. It's all done. It's already taken care of. It's been taken care of at the cross. So the promised land does not symbolize heaven. No, rather, the promised land symbolizes a victorious Christian life here and now. So not only do we have to learn the word of God, there's those wandering wilderness times. There's those walking through the wilderness times, I should say. Where we, where we learn the word of God, but then we've got to remove our foot from the trap. And unbelief will keep you from receiving the promise of God in your life. So, avoiding the trap of unbelief. Number one is we've got to learn the word of God. Secondly, we've got to remove our foot from entering the trap. Final thing for today is keep faith turned on. What do I mean by that? Think about a light switch for a second. As long as that light switch is turned on, you've got light. You can walk around, you don't trip on anything, there's nothing hindering you, you can go move around obstacles, you can see what's in the way of your path. But the moment that light switch is turned off, now all of a sudden you're in darkness. Groping about, you don't have direction, you don't have vision, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall, you're going to hurt your shins on the coffee table, whatever it is, right? There's things that are going to get in your way and you're going to fall into those traps. And so you and I, if we're going to avoid the trap of unbelief, we've got to keep faith 
turned on. Now, the Bible tells us that the children of Israel did have faith. When they left Egypt, they had faith. In fact, when Moses and Aaron came and spoke to the elders of Israel, and they told them that God was going to deliver them, they believed the word of the Lord, they bowed their heads, and they worshiped God. They believed God. They had faith to leave Egypt. In fact, they even had faith to pass through the Red Sea because the Bible says that by faith, they passed through the Red Sea. And behind them, God wipes out the greatest army of the greatest nation at that time of Egypt. So by faith, they plundered Egypt, they wiped Egypt out, they passed through the Red Sea, but they get to the border of the promised land and they let the faith switch get turned off. Why? Because they operated in unbelief and they fell into the trap. And because of it, they were turned away from the promise of God for their life. Let's learn something, church, that if we're going to stay away from the trap of unbelief, we've got to keep that faith switch turned on. There's a man by the name of Abraham. You know him as Abraham, the father of faith. And Abraham, we see an example of his life. You're there in the book of Mark. Turn with me past Luke, John, Acts, and go with me to the book of Romans. We're going to go to Romans chapter number 4. And we see the example of Abraham in his life. And Abraham had a promise from God. Promise was of a supernatural birth in his old age. Abraham was 100 years old. His wife was 90 years old. And so his wife was going to conceive and bear a son in her old age. And Abraham kept the faith switch turned on. Let's read it together in Romans, the fourth chapter, starting in verse number 20. And we're going to read through verse number 21. Romans chapter 4, verse 20 says these words. It says, he, speaking of Abraham, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. In other words, he didn't play with the switch. He didn't waver. He didn't, he didn't let it turn off and turn on and turn off. And turn, no, no, no. He didn't waver. He didn't mess with it. He kept faith turned on. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21, and being fully convinced... That what he, speaking of God, had promised, he was also able to perform. You see, the children of Israel, they had heard the promise of God, but they didn't think God could perform. They knew God was going to give them the promised land, but they didn't think he would make good on the promise. They didn't think he could take care of some giants. Even though he could wipe out the greatest nation on the planet, God can't take care of the giants that I'm facing now. But Abraham, when Abraham heard the promise of God, the Bible says he did not waver, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, supernatural childbearing, supernatural birth in their old age, but also God had made some other promises to Abraham. Blessing, I will bless you. Those who curse you, I will curse, right? Those who come against you will, 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 be, will flee from before you, right? Uh, and, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. See, Abraham was believing for more than just that child, the physical, natural child. No, he was looking forward, the Bible says, to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You and I have got to keep the face switch turned on. We've got to look to our Jesus, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and remember that he who promised is also able to perform. Hallelujah. A couple of things we learned today about avoiding the trap of unbelief. Number one is that we've got to learn the word of God. Don't believe or learn the lie. Let's learn the truth of the word of God and the truth shall set you free. Second is remove your foot from entering the trap. If you realize and recognize, oh my goodness, I'm operating in unbelief right now. Hey, get out of that trap. Take your foot out. Go and repent and return to the Lord. And finally is keep faith turned on. Don't waver but be strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, because he who promised is also able to perform. If you got something from the word today, come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you guys were wonderful. I want to thank you for listening to the word of God today. I really believe you got something from the word of God and, and know that you were listening and, and, and soaking in what God was speaking to you. Let's not stop there. It'd be a tragedy for us to come into the house of God, sing songs, experience the presence of God, receive the word of God, and yet you walk out of this place, your heart's not right with God, you die and go to hell. God forbid that should happen to anybody in this room. I don't want that to happen. God doesn't want that to happen. So let's talk. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. What if? What if you left this place and it was your last day here on the earth? You died. Where would you go? Would you end up in heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. You don't have to say anything out loud. Just check yourself out right now. Where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? 
I don't think anybody wants to go to hell, but sometimes people hear that and they say, well, I don't believe in hell. Wasn't that convenient? But listen, the Bible speaks about hell. Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus talked about hell. Hell is a very real place, and by denying hell's existence doesn't make it any less real. That's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. You go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway, say, I don't believe in semi-trucks, that's a trap. Eventually, you're going to meet one face to face. So just by saying, I don't believe in hell doesn't make hell any less real for your life. So you got to check yourself out. Sometimes people say, well, I think I would go to heaven. I hope I'd go to heaven. Maybe I'd go to heaven. I really don't know. Listen, you can't think hope or maybe your way into the kingdom of God. You got to know how to get there beyond a shadow of a doubt. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means we're not going to get there your way. Not going to get there my way. Not going to get there some well-meaning church committee's way. Not all roads lead to heaven any more than all roads lead to the moon. You got to get there one way. And Jesus said, I am that way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say, oh, that's good, good news, because, you know, I know that God lets good people into heaven. I've been a really good person. You know, I might have used to have been bad, but I changed my behavior, now I'm good. And, and I've helped people out, gave money to charities, been nice to my neighbors. I've been really good, and God's going to let me into heaven because I've been good. Really, because I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says you can be good enough to get to heaven. I, I don't find any grading scale in the Bible or any curve that you have to be above. And, and, and as long as you're above that amount of goodness, you get to go to heaven. Here's my question for you. How good do you have to be? Because the Bible doesn't say anything except for perfection. That's the standard in order to get into heaven. And you're, you're not going to get there by your own works because we read in the book of Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to get there just by being good. In fact, the Bible says your goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. It means they're going to be thrown out. Not going to get there just by being good. Can't be good enough. Sometimes people say, but I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Been in church all my life. I wore a cross or St. Christopher around my neck. My parents had me baptized or christened as a child. Went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism class. And, and you were born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America goes to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven denying hell. Right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're a Christian that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry or because you have uh, gone to religious classes, been baptized or christened as a child, or because you're born in America that America is a Christian nation and that your citizenship in America automatically gives you citizenship in heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God is looking at your life and seeing, oh, well, you're not any other religion. Therefore, by default, he lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. Listen, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough today to tell you the truth and not play games. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. And if you were to die today, you would end up in hell. Come on, listen up. Let's talk. Let's talk. Some of you might have said this. You might have said, well, you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am in, sitting in church right now. I'm sitting in front of you, Pastor. And doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I sit in church and call myself a Christian? No. No, it does not. Any more than you can go down the ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. It simply doesn't work like that. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. You say, but at my last church, I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir, taught in the classes, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things, but could you show that to me in the Bible where you get involved, help out, sing in the choir? teaching the Bible classes, make decisions, people think of you as a leader, that gets you into heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God's waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can get in. It does not work like that. That's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven. Come on. You're not going to make it. Some of you say, but I know God. Somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. You know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament, tell you stories out of the Bible, and I know God, therefore I'm a Christian. Well, have you read your Bible? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is, quotes scriptures in the Bible, yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having mental assent or head knowledge about who Jesus is. God sees what you have in your head and says, oh, they, they know about me, therefore they can go to heaven. No, 
It's not what this is about. Rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. There was a religious leader that came to Jesus by the name of Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a good guy, did good things his entire life. He was raised in his church called the synagogue. If we would have thought anyone was headed for heaven, we would have thought it was this guy. Why? Because he was a leader. He, he taught the people. He could quote the scriptures. He could sing the scriptures. This guy did many good deeds and, and gave his money. And yet when Jesus comes to this great man, we would have thought he would have pat him on the back and said, Hey, Nick, man, just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does Jesus say? He says, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. Pop culture's raked it through the coals. It's not about what society or pop culture says. Rather, this is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Here's what it means. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? Lukewarm. What, what, what's lukewarm? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why? Because there's a trap. And I love you enough today to tell you the truth. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven and denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. Get over it. Why do I say that? Because think about it. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth, not play games. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He died so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins, but he was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Now it's your call, it's your choice. Will you give him all of your heart? Give him all of your life. Confess him before men. I'll see your hand. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than being in hell for eternity. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Now, who should raise your hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've never done this, never giving God all your heart and all your life, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, don't leave this place unsure. Make sure today before you leave. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart. Get ready to get your hand up in the safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or on the live stream, God's watching you right where you're at. If you're here on campus telling usher right afterwards or come into the church service, or if you're on the live stream right after you do that, there's a button you can click that says respond to God and someone will pop up there our pastor and he'll pray a prayer with you to invite Jesus into your heart. All across this auditorium, get ready. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. There's four. Thank you. God bless you. On this side, where are you at? Five up on top. Got you. Six in the family room. Thank you. Seven right here. Got you. God bless you. Anybody else up on top? Eight. Thank you. God bless you. Nine up there. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Nine, ten. Thank you. Eleven. Thank you. Twelve. I got you up there on top. Got you. Got you. About eleven or twelve. Up on top. Yeah, I got you. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Anybody else real quick? About eleven or twelve wise people. Anybody else real quick? You need to give God all your heart and all your life up there. Thank you. Thank you. Gotcha. 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 On this side. Thank you. Up top. Where are they at? Right there. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? There are about 13, 14 wise people. That's you. You need to get right with God. Come on. Come on. I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Where are you at? Number 14. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. 
God just spoke to you right now. You're wondering about this. You should. Come on, just lift your hand up real quick. Real quick, if that's you. In the family room, thank you. Number 14, we're at number 15. Number 15, come on, just lift it up real quick. Sitting there wondering if you should. You should do this. Come on, go for it. Go for it. You need to give God all your heart and all your life. You've been running from God instead of to God. Come on, real quick. If you're not sure, come on, make sure. Thank you. Thank you, number 15. Anybody else, real quick, real quick. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Hallelujah. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to ask no one to leave during this time. That's rude to the Holy Spirit. Also, it's rude to the people that we're trying to get to give their heart and life to Jesus. So no one leaves. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. As we do, Elijah's going to sing a song. That's your cue. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand to get your stuff, what have you brought with you to church, bring a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you just get your stuff, get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. Come on, let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on. Lord, come on. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. They're coming. You can come too. And the family is bring your kids. They'll remember this. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. You can come too. Every moment I'm away. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, come on. Lord, have your way. Even if you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Just get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me up front. Hallelujah. Come on, you can come too. Come on, come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, we've got room for you. We've got room for you. Come on down. Come on down. Anybody else? Come on, they're still coming. Come on. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? You came to give God all of your heart, came to give God all of your life. You're going to be born again, all right? Now, listen, I have a friend I want to introduce you to right over here, way in the back over there, Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel, come on, cut through the crowd here. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Here he is standing up there waving at you. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you wonder when you go to church, you wonder if they're weird. He's cool, all right? He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Then he's going to give you some free stuff, all right? Everybody loves free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. That's a pretty good relationship already, okay? A couple free booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. You can invest 20 minutes, sit down and read through that booklet, find out, hey, what, what's next? I'll, I'll give you a hint on one of the things that you need to do. Get back to church as often as possible, okay? Third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you a friend. You say, a What? Give you a friend. That's, that's what we do here at The Rock is we give away friends. That's just how we roll, all right? And, and, and we call them spiritual personal trainers. Basically, you heard of a physical trainer? Helps you get strong and buff, right? Okay? A, a spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will do that for you spiritually, help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back and serve the devil and fall into that trap of unbelief but that you go on with God into the promises that he has for your life. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah!